This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hey, aloha and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. This is Andrew, the security guy, with another episode of Security Matters coming your way. Today we've got one of our favorite sort of convergent security engineering guys, Rodney Thayer, is going to be with us. We're going to be talking about a lot of the programs that are happening um, inside the Security Industry Association, which is one of our favorite um, sort of lobbying bodies and, and really get into standards development. And SIA does a lot of things. Uh, Rodney works really well inside that group. And Rodney, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, I wish you were in the studio where you've been before, but at least we've got you remote. How you doing? I'm doing okay. All right, it's good to see you, man. Hey, um, I tell you what, we, um, I try to get my guests to talk a little bit about the, the things from their perspective in the security industry that kind of keep them up at night, man. So what's, uh, what's going on for you these days? Uh, what keeps me up at night these days is worrying about people being able to uh, make illicit copies of uh, access control cards. You know, oh. these card clones you can buy online and that kind of stuff, um, which is uh, easy to buy on Amazon and not necessarily well known in the, the electronic door lock community that, that that stuff's available. So that worries me. You know, we've, um, we've demoed a little bit of that problem at Interop. I think uh, you were the guy with the copy gun, and it took you about 10 seconds to make yep. a copy of a card. Yep. <laughs> so. And. Uh, go ahead. So that, that, that kind of technology is, is commonly available. And even though we know how to build things better and that are quite practical, uh, that, that level of, of stuff is still being used a lot. So uh, we're still trying to sort of make sure, you know, friends don't let friends use procs is kind of what we say. Yeah, you know, it, it concerns me that we've, you know, we've been talking about this for several years now, this, this, this problem with proximity cards. Even the problem with some of the higher level cards that can have a certificate that's not managed well or not managed properly or not implemented properly, um, a lot of that stuff can still be copied. So there's, there's problems out there that it seems like I think the customers aren't aware of and they're not asking their integrators to fix those problems. Well, what's your take on that? Are you seeing that mostly at the government level? Is it, is it getting down into healthcare and you know, other critical infrastructures? Or, or is awareness growing? Or even HID's website tells you like 90% of the industry is still using these unsecured prox cards for you know, perimeter access control. And I think that's a problem. Maybe it's just all awareness. So there, there are customers are getting better and better about this. So it tends to be the, the bigger businesses that understand it. Um, there's still a lot in the vendor community who, you know, they, they've been doing it that way for, you know, 30 years, 100 years, whatever it is, and they just keep doing it the same way because they're, they're, they're not interested in changing. The thing that concerns me is, you know, some, some kid is going to get online and buy one of these things on Amazon and then, you know, blow through a neighborhood and, and pop all the doors for all those brand new condos they put in downtown Oakland. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I do get the feeling that the, the level of problem it's not really being addressed very well at all levels. I, I see, I just left an InfraGuard meeting before we came here today to the studio, and there's a, you know, there's, there's a growing awareness up in the critical infrastructures and, you know, obviously in the NIP sector, and DHS is working to spread the word about physical and, and, and you know, cybersecurity, where we fit in that role, and access control is such a big piece of that, and the credential is the big, well, one of the big problems. We'll get into the, uh, to the, uh, the transmission method a little bit later on today, but... Um, I tell you what, let's talk a little bit about what C is up to. You've got a great thing that is uh, you're doing over there. Um, you're, you've got some sessions, and I wasn't sure if they were monthly or weekly, but you're allowing people to call in, and I'm presuming these are CIA members only or, or maybe the public, but, um, and you're giving them some cybersecurity advice, kind of a, a Q&A from the top. Um, tell us about that, man. What's going on? So, so the, uh, Don Erickson uh, came up, the, you know, head of CIA uh, came up with this idea that the, the concept is for the vendors that are inside the the uh, CIA, the vendor secure you know vendor community there okay. uh, trying to uh, provide opportunities for them to uh, ask questions that are you know sort of in general nature about uh, how to improve the cybersecurity you know, posture and, and technology and stuff inside their products because you know they're, they're like I said the customers are asking for more and more safe things and so we're trying to help you know and, you know see as a vendor you know member association. And so we're trying to help that community uh, make things better. And, and you know, we, we, do, we talk about, you know, bad cards and this and that, but there are a lot of vendors out there trying to get better ah. uh, and some doing, they're making a lot of progress on it. So, so there's definitely interest in this. And so, you know, they, they wanted to kind of 
that's part of their ongoing program to try to help the vendors improve their cybersecurity position. Yeah, and is that, so is it sort of a one-on-one, -on -one, like they're, they're just channeled into you, or is it like a, a lot? I, I'm sorry, I haven't gotten to listen in yet, so I didn't know, is it, but, are people embarrassed to say, hey, I don't know about this, or how, how do you find the, you well, know, the conversations go? They they uh, they contact us over over the either the SIA has a vendor community forum or through that or through email. Okay. So they don't actually get have to. They're not actually questioned live on the air or anything. That you know, I see. We take the questions and we go, we uh, uh, explore how to answer that. So usually we do a, se a segment like that and then uh, uh, some sort of small kind of lecture thing. So like the one we're going to do tomorrow is going to be. Uh, you know, sort of the, the general subject of what do you do to worry about backdoors and, you know, somebody might put a chip in your circuit board, things ah. like that. Um, and then we usually follow up with some sort of, you know, some sort of a, a, a joke thing, a, a kind of, you know, try to be more humorous. So, you know, we've been riffing on the idea of we, we find some strange picture and ask how your facial recognition testing is going. Ah. So, you know, the last, the last picture we found was uh, Google put up a, a challenge that if you take a parakeet and put it on a toy tricycle, and put that in front of certain kinds of uh, recognition systems. They think that's a truck. <laughs> so that, you know, this kind of, you know, how's that facial recognition testing going? Because you know, we, we all care, you know, care about the false positives and negatives of such things. Yeah, I think um, I, I, you know, I, I see that I see the words AI, which I'm not, I don't even believe exist yet, uh, used all the time when it's really just machine learning. And just like the analytics of old machine learning has a long way to go, you know, and, it, and, it, it, and it, it's very quick in certain instances and very error prone in others, you know, and um, what, so if you're getting, a, if you're getting some questions about that, what are you, what's your thoughts on what, what you've seen and, and, you know, the industry adoption, is industry knowledge, you think, going up or, um, you know, is, are people just still scared? Uh, what, what, what's the feeling there? So the, the feeling I get is that the, the, the industry is feeling more pressure from their customers to ah. uh, be concerned about these sort of things. And so, you know, the, the, the optimal situation is that I get the phone call from the sales guy who just tried to visit some big dot-com company in the Silicon Valley area, and he got scolded because his product didn't have appropriate encryption features in it. Okay. And basically, he got told he can't do the sales call if he doesn't get his act together. I see. And they're, they're putting their foot down at that level. And you know, you stop the sales guy from making a sale, and that gets the customer's attention. Ah. It gets the vendor's attention. Excuse me. Um, so that we're getting that kind of you know market pressure, I believe, is the uh, the term they use. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and people are responding. Yeah, and we've had what's interesting. We've had products like uh, BriefCam for many years now. That's uh, quite an, an amazing tool. And I think that uh, end users get confused that, that that all new tools will just automatically work. You know, I think BriefCam's maybe been around a decade. So it's quite mature in, in, in its functionality today and the things that it can do. And it, it rolled out the gate pretty pretty well, but it's taking it time to get better and faster and all those sort of things. And I, I get the feeling that the customers see stuff either on YouTube or it, I don't know if it gets emailed to them from a vendor or they read some, some list of hot technology that they follow or ZDNet, whatever it may be. And then they, they expect their you know, integrator to be able to deliver this stuff for them. Oh, we can take advantage of that right away. And um, so what you're feeling is that the vendors are then trying to figure out maybe from the expertise that you have, is it really viable yet or, or, or what are my options? Is that what they're coming to you for? Well, they're, they're, they're coming to you if they figured out they haven't secured the thing. They, they, uh, they'll, they'll get the shiny new technology. Uh, <laughs> they'll install it. It'll be easy to install, in quote marks. Yeah. Um, but uh, easy doesn't necessarily mean secure. So uh, sort of they have to go through kind of an enlightenment process. First, you have to get them to understand to use the new technology, and then you've got to worry about, you know, uh, sort of you know, setting all the knobs and dials to the secure position. Uh, and that's, that has implications. It's more work. Somebody has to get more training. The job site takes more, you know, more minutes per door or whatever camera. Um, so it, it, has, it has business implications doing things more secure. And, th and they're working their way through these kind of issues. Hmm. Um, so are they, um, do you find people getting more knowledgeable about tools? I'm wondering who, sort of who calls you. Are you getting sales guys? Are you getting owners? Are you getting engineers? You know, guys are, are they scanning their networks with tools like InMap, which I've talked about, which you've talked about, and, and finding out, wow, we've got all these open ports. How do we close them? Or are they, are they using the tools that are out there yet? Or, or what kind of, do you get questions that are about? I get questions you know, like that, yeah. Okay. The, the, okay. The classic example is the, the vendor, you know, uh, says to me, okay, so we ran a scan on our product and we discovered we had all these ports open we didn't know about. And the, the really bad one is that they do a scan on a live system to go, and then we figured out there were all these connections to, you know, insert name of other country here. 
Um, <laughs> and they're going, ooh. And, and so, you know, the, 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 the sweet spot, unfortunately, is when the vendor themselves figures out that their product is compromised in the field and they really ought to fix that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, and the people seeing things like that, um, the, you know, a, a, a better place to be is that they get uh, some feedback that the scans failed because the like big enterprises, even not so big enterprises, are running these scanning services and, and tools on the inside. And, and uh, you can't hide the physical security stuff from the network team anymore. They used to do that, but, you know, that, that doesn't work very well anymore. I mean, if it's the network and it's got switch ports and things like that, it needs to be taken care of. It's not about what network it's plugged into. It's if it's, you know, on the property and part of the business's equipment. Yeah, there's... Um I, st I still see, or I, heard, I hear a lot of people talking about just, well, if I completely isolate that network, then I don't have to worry about the customer's network. And then I said, well, how do you get updates to it? Or does it just sit there for years running on its own without ever getting updated and you're not updating drivers or firmware or, or scanning it to find out what's going on with it? Just because it's sitting there doesn't mean someone's not compromised it or take some, taking something that's really bad from it and walked like across that air gap to the corporate WAN with some USB drive that's got a video clip on it that you took out of the, the system that's, you know, yeah, yeah. supposedly isolated. It's very hard to keep the network air gapped. Um, yeah. The data flows in and out all the time for various reasons, uh, sometimes on purpose, sometimes unintentional. Yeah. So they'll hit this, this kind of stuff. Um, and that's, that's just the classical network paths. I mean, then there's all the extra thing. You know, people walk in the room with a mobile phone on their body, you know, yeah. and they think things are still air gapped. Yeah. Um, so it's, so we, uh, you know, we're, the world is more connected, more and more connected, and, and that makes the air gap thing sort of, you know, not real anymore. Sort of moot. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Um, what's the most popular sort of, have you guys built a Q&A? What's the most popular sort of um, a, a request that you're seeing uh, on, the, on that program? So the, the, we've, we've only got a few of them. Sort of the general pattern is people asking about the cryptography questions. Oh, okay. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, you know my, my joke description is, you know, they're all retired law enforcement. They know 27 different kinds of ammunition, but they have no idea what a, C, a TLS cipher suite is. Sure. Uh, and, and yet that's a critical thing to worry about because you have to have your, your encryption capabilities set properly. Okay, uh, good. So trying to sort of the, helping with the, getting the, demystifying the crypto, um, which is, you know, a challenge for everybody. Uh, yeah, including me. So I tell you what we'll do. Let's we'll talk about a good place where we're using crypto that we didn't even have a few years ago. When we come back, um, we'll take a break and pay some bills, and we'll be right back with um, Rodney Thayer in about a minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. If you're not in control of how you see yourself, then who is? Live above the influence. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. Go to hungeris.org to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios. We're with Rodney Thayer today, and we're talking now about uh, cryptography and sort of this problem. He, he gets a lot of uh, questions about this on a um, audible uh, uh, sort of a forum that they run, the Security Indus Industry Association runs that Rodney consults on for our vendor partners out there who are concerned about cryptography. Let's talk about OSDP, which is another standard that was built uh, with the Security Industry Association and others um, to replace the aging Wagen protocol for my Viewers out there, Wagand is the protocol we used for years to talk downstream from a card reader to the other equipment. It was very insecure. It's subject to replay attacks and all, all kinds of other uh, problems. Uh, it could not be secured. So we've now built a new protocol called OSDP, which Rodney was a part of. So let's just talk a little bit. Uh, give us the evolution of OSDP. I sort of know why, because Wagan was broken. So tell us how you got involved with getting that started. Uh, so, OSDP has been around for several years. Uh, there was a thing called OSP version 1 
which was done about 10 years ago, uh, maybe more, um, by uh, Linnell and HID and some and Mercury and some of the folks. Um, and uh, they, the, I, I showed up uh, relatively recently, like five, six years ago, to the process, and they were doing oh. OSTP version two, okay. which is where they were. Uh, they, that was where they added the encryption capabilities to it, and they took it from being – it was originally a handful of vendors working together, you know, cooperating, yay, um, and then they decided that they wanted to take the standard further, so they, they uh, migrated it over to being a SIA project. Oh, awesome. Um, and so, uh, so I, I have a background in software development, so I showed up at one of the meetings, and I made the obvious comment in the mid-2000s, which is, so who did the open source version? And – First, I got silence, and then they said, <laughs> well, we've got budget. Would you like to do that? And so, you know, never ask for something that, unless you're ready to handle it. So ah. I now have the uh, – so I'm the one who built the open source implementation, and it's a GitHub repository and all that stuff. Awesome. Uh, Thank you for so sharing. So what happened was – sure, yeah. That's, I mean, that's the way we do things on the Internet. That's right. So with Wiegand, Wiegand is so primitive, it's, it's, it's a question to call it a protocol because it's <laughs> – you put a card next to a card reader – and some electrical signals come out of the wire and go to the other end. Yeah. End of discussion. There's no two-way conversation. Yeah. There's no concept of acknowledgments or anything. It's, uh, it's so old it had two parity bits, one in the front and one in the back. Yeah. So if you're not into the electricity of that sort of thing, that's about a 1970s era way of building yeah. things. And if you don't bias um, it properly, it will not work. <laughs> it's got all kinds yes, of problems. And then, and then, yeah, so we're, we're, we're running uh, the electrical characteristics that are just barely beyond what Thomas and Edison, what Thomas Edison <laughs> used to do. He, 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 was a, he was an integrator, you know. He actually had door lock sensors and stuff he sold. Wow. Um, so uh, the OSCP runs over RS-45, which is a serial protocol uh, similar to RS-232, which people may have heard of. Um, and so the, since it's, it's a bidirectional protocol, you can send messages back and forth. And so OSDP was built on top of that. And now we've got the classic kind of technology where there's messages back and forth, there's acknowledgments. Messages can have a cyclic redundancy check, a CRC on them, so you can have very strong error correction. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, and then there's you know, a bunch of other capabilities to it. So that's, that's sort of where it, it, went to. it went to. It went from Wigan hardware to 485 hardware, which is mm -hmm. easily available today and very robust. Um, and then we could build a, this technology on top of it. Yeah, and it, and it seems like in a lot of cases, I, I find that the uh, reader specification was an 18-gauge cable. And in many cases, you can you need to change the board hardware and the reader hardware to use an OSDP-compatible reader. But we are able to use the existing cabling infrastructure in, in many cases. So there is some cost savings there from that forklift perspective that you know every end user is afraid of that kind of expense, right? Right. Um, now that I, I agree with what you said about the 18 gauge cable, except that uh, uh, you know people people used to do crazy things with weakened cables, uh, uh, yeah. so they would um, so you, you you can't assume every single cable in the wall is valid. Yeah. Um, so people really should use it. There is, and there are tools to do this. These cable certification devices, and what they're doing is they'll measure uh, capacitance of the wire, capacitance yeah. of the wire, and things like that. Yeah, um, there's so, a lot yeah, of in general, you can use. Yeah, there's those there's those. Uh, uh, well, they're invisible until you go looking for them, T-taps all over the place that cause uh, capacitance and inductance issues with those lines downstream. And uh, you, may not, you may not get OSDP capability overall cabling. So, yeah, it should not be presumed. Yeah, you, you paid the kid to run that wire, and there's 15 different twist-on handgun connections up in the <laughs> ceiling, and nobody ever saw them before. <laughs> and they've been sitting there rusting for the last 15 years, and now you're on a run... RS-45 over that at 100,000 bits per second, and you wonder why you get errors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, the Wagon would work fine on that wire, by the way, but this, uh, this protocol will not. So, um, so we gain, uh, you talked a little about the two-way, and so for my audience, you know, this means we can actually send maybe uh, text messages out to a card reader to let someone know that they need to do something. Uh, we can send a different type of color to the uh, reader, for example, to, to indicate something. Uh, we can also finally upgrade the reader remotely, like push a firmware update out to the reader. So this is something we've never had the capability to do in our industry. Um, how uh, do you see that developing? I know that's fairly, you know, at the front edge of what we're doing today, but is, it, is that going to be a, a something that we can reasonably expect our, our manufacturing community to support? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So 
what we what we get is that we, when we start to have a, a real communication protocol, they, that's what the S is for supervised. So what that means is when the, it's supervised is an old physical security term. It means you know the thing at the other end of the wire. If it died, you know it died. Yeah. Uh, so in, in in the protocol world, we call those acknowledgments. We have since the 80s, but that's a whole IT versus physical security thing. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, so you know the line, you know the thing at the other end didn't die, uh, and you have acknowledge messages, and it's a uh, you're sending control messages back and forth, which command the reader to do things. So in the old days, you had to wire up an extra wire to make sure the LED lit up. Uh, with, with OSDP, as, as you said, you, you send a command. You want a red LED, you tell it to blink for whatever you want. Sure. Um, but it's commands. It's all over the OSDP one pair of wires. Uh, so we, have, we can send more rich messages back and forth. Uh, we can use more fancy cards. We can, like the, in the federal environment, they're using PIV cards, for example, oh, yeah. which has a more complicated uh, dialogue back and forth over the wire. Uh, and, and, yeah, we can send text messages. We can, you, know, you, can do, you can do beeping. You can do uh, LED controls. Uh, and there can be manufacturer-specific commands. There, there's some reader that's made in Sweden that has a, a ring around the outside of the reader. And we call it a mood ring. Um, apparently, they use it on, on doors at uh, conference rooms. And so the thing starts glowing when it's the end of your conference, uh, you know, wow. end of your time in the conference room. That's awesome. Um, so you can, you can innovate things like that. And this is sort of this is. I mean, if you look at it from the point of view of the IoT world, this is kind of normal IoT stuff. I mean, you can you can do firmware updates over the air. Mm -hmm. You can uh, send commands down to the device. The, the the device is. I mean, it's the same thing. You know, if the device is a computer with with some kind of smarts in it, that's that's engaging this dialogue with the with the head end equipment, and you get all the benefits of that kind of an arrangement. Yeah, and and and, and we get encryption. So let's yeah, talk a, a little bit. Give us just the, the primer on TLS, and this is the latest version. TLS 1.2 has now been proven to work over OSDP. Um, oh, wait. So there's, there's different. So the other thing about the OSDP is it's because it's a protocol, it's done with the, the OSI model, kind okay. of that kind of a view. So the original stuff ran over RS-45, and because the equipment was a little primitive, uh, they, they used uh, AES encryption in a fairly simple way uh, that was similar to what the, the smart card industry had done. Okay. Um, okay. A group called Global Platform had, had created a mechanism. Then, uh, uh, as readers have become more and more complicated, more sophisticated, uh, it's not complex. It's the fact they have bigger computers in them. Um, you know, so we're still getting we're still smaller than a cell phone here. If you sort of think about how much computing power there sure. is. Sure. Um, so once they go to network capabilities, then they can start doing TLS or transport layer security. Okay. Uh, and so you can do OSDP over 45 cable. You can do it over TLS. You can do it over TCP. That's that's the three cases that have been built so far. Mm. Um, and yes, if they use TLS, uh, they can use the latest stuff, which is TLS 1.3. And there's a published standard for 1.3. Okay. And there, it's it is it, you know it's done. It's in the field. You know Facebook uses it. FB.com uses it. Ah. Um, so you, you know it's definitely out there. Um, and so you, you this is an example of you should be using the latest greatest encryption. You should be using a product that uh, is capable of being updated. You should run the latest stuff. You know I'm now this is the broken record where I'm saying this sort of standard security advice we give people. Sure. And we can start to apply all those good rules to the OS to the uh, physical security door lock world uh, with OSDP. Yeah. Is um, can you give us because um, I know you're a cryptographer. Is the can you give us the order of magnitude stronger that TLS 1.3 is versus TLS 1.2, maybe versus TLS 1.1, which is now I guess expired or, or no longer in use. Uh, deprecated is the term. Deprecated. Sorry. Uh, we, thank we, you. Yes, we really try to avoid using it if we can. Uh, so 1.3, they made the they made the protocol more robust. Uh, they added some extra capabilities so you can uh, avoid uh, spoofing of things because uh, mm. um, it, it was possible. It's a complex protocol, so it was possible for there to be issues around uh, setting up a session uh, so see. an adversary could get in the middle and do stuff. Mm. And they've been doing improvements like that. They've also um, ad added some more uh, crypto options that weren't there in the in the older stuff. So now we can use elliptic curve, and uh, so when you use RSA. If you're using the RSA algorithm, you can use a more uh, a stronger format for digital signatures. I see. Because uh, the way this works is that as, as the state of the art advances and the state of the attack art advances, mm -hmm. people have found issues. I see. So, uh, like the digital signature mechanism we did in the they basically came from the late 90s uh, that we've been using for years with TLS. They finally switched that, so it's using uh, RSA, SSS, PSA. 
yes, 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 yes. But this is one of these things like, you know, the new buzzwords have only, they're only six months old. I can't just, you know, rattle them off like I'm using for 15 years. <laughs> the, but the um, good thing is we're getting better. And the, the really important thing is that the yeah. physical security industry is able to leverage this. We're starting to adopt yeah. the sort of IT standards that we've always needed that we didn't have. Yeah. Right. And we're realizing the physical security world is a target. Um, and I'm talking about network targets. I mean, they are, you know, all the physical security people know that somebody might throw a rock through the window of your storefront. Sure. But, you know, we, we also have to worry about the, you know, they might try to attack your door lock system or your, uh, you know, cameras or something else about your infrastructure because your infrastructure's network is uh, a target. So who do you think needs to be taking advantage of this right away? Like my brain always goes, you know, critical infrastructure. Oh my gosh, they, you know, the, the power companies and, or is this something that the integrators need to talk about to everybody? You know, Joe, Joe's car garage up the street. Is this something we just need to bring up, bring awareness up and get everybody up to speed? Well, so the, the fact that it's a standard means that you can have multiple implementations that, that work the same. And so you have uh, options, you have more options, more diversity. I mean, they're, they're, last time I checked, there was probably 50 different implementations and most of them uh, card readers and, and, you know, some panels kind of kind of stuff. Um, so you have many different options now that you didn't have before uh, in terms of uh, what you can design into a system. So it's got, it gives you uh, more choices because of this, the being able to leverage uh, standardization and you get the security. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's still applicable, even if you're not, even if you're not doing one of those Navy facilities you hang out at. Sure. Um, so, but, but certainly for something of a very high security level, it, it facilitates doing the, the more robust kind of a door lock system you'd want to do there. This is awesome stuff coming from the security industry association, Rodney, coming from you. We really appreciate the help because this, the whole industry needs to come up. And I've been on that soapbox for a while with, with uh, a little pushing from Rodney right there on, on the screen. Um, we, um, we are not seeing a lot of requests in Hawaii for that. We, we've done a little bit inside critical infrastructure, so there's definitely some of this more advanced access control work going on. But I sure hope that it continues to get pushed out and everybody continues to work on it. Uh, we will uh, get Rodney back in here maybe every quarter, ever, every few months if we can to get an update from him on, on what's going on. He's kind of got his finger on the pulse, especially with those, those queries coming in to see you. So see you members, if you've got some questions about what you're doing, definitely call into that session and get some help. Uh, the rest of Hawaii, if you need something, reach out to us. We'll, we'll try to get you into the right information. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in today. Rodney, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, we'll see you next week, uh, Wednesday, 1 o'clock because security matters.